G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, Get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. Man, this works perfectly. I've got pop and little ripper. Oh, can I be Little Ripper? Ripper? No. <laughs> I don't want to be Granddad. I don't want to be Pop. You don't want to be Pop. Hey, yeah. Pop could be Dad as well. Coke's doing well with this, aren't they? With these- um, Well, it's just- It's a great, great marketing campaign on. because you keep buying to get new ones. And they seem to be putting different sets out. So, yeah, yeah. when they first started, it was the same as they had a couple of years ago when they did it. Yeah. And then they put nicknames out, which are obviously these. And now they seem to have slang terms as well. So well, that's uh, why recently I harassed you, didn't I? And I'm like, collect all the slang term ones. It's going to be weird. Uh, Yeah, you're going to have to move the mic away a bit. Rearrange yourself. So we've just opened some cokes for anyone thinking about what the hell are we talking about? Exactly. So we are. What would you call them? Commercial slaves to to coke. We are. Hey, I've got I've got shares in Coca Cola. So uh, (laughs) yeah, I'm just. uh, I get probably every can we drink. I probably get about one billionth of a cent. So damn, just got to keep. And yet you got to spend fifty billionths of that to get the can. Well, exactly. Or more. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I guess for for context, for anyone who isn't in Australia, Coke has um, probably in the last few years, right, I think they started putting um, Coke cans out with names on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you you get Ian, Pete. You would would obviously get them at a party or something and people, I guess the idea is for you to go and grab one and be like, oh, look, it's Jane. Jane, did you want a Coke? Yes. And then more recently, they've started putting slang terms on them. And I've got a whole bunch behind me. So, I've got Nan, Mums, Fav, Bogan, Buffed. Legend. Yeah. So, that was the annoying thing. Originally, I was like, collect them. I want to get all these different slang terms, but they're obviously all slang terms related to what you would call someone. Yes. Because you're not going to yeah. have, you know, flat out like a lizard drinking on the can. No, exactly. You yeah. can't really go and get that for someone who's got that nickname. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, Coke, if you're listening, mm. pay me for the advertisements for free advertising. Just pay him in <laughs> diet, Coke. Mm. Yeah, that's it. So, what are we talking about, Dad? We're getting number one. This is um, the latest GOSS episode, obviously. Yeah. Guys, don't forget yeah. if you want the transcripts and everything, sign up for the premium podcast or academy membership. And um, we're in the new house. You are. Yeah. First time in the house. new studio. So, the background's different. That's, I haven't got the a angles are different. behind me and the angles are different. And actually, mine's sort of the same. Yours, yeah, yeah, more or less. You didn't have yeah. bookshelves behind you last time. No, I had a, sort of a flat half wall. a window and a flat wall. Yeah. yeah, you've got, I don't know, what do you got, a bit more space? You got, got a bit less space? Um, <laughs> I've got more width, but less depth. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, uh, d- given that I'm losing a bit of width and depth as well, mm. is, um, this probably doesn't really matter. But. Yeah, so what do you think of the new house compared to the old one? It's great. Yeah, I really like it. it um, it's got more running around space for Noah. Um, and it's just newer and in better condition, obviously. Maybe we can do the first episode talking about um, housing and what people should sort of consider, especially if they are migrating to Mm. Australia and if they become Australian citizens, I imagine that they are 
eligible for the first home first, first home, home buyers, buyers um, grant or grant. whatever it is from the yeah. government. Yeah. Because I- So, I guess to give a bit of context, you'll find in Australia nowadays, a lot of houses that have been built in the past, obviously, through different periods. Most commonly, there are lots of these older houses from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Or even from the 19th century in the the suburbs of the old cities. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll see new housing developments, especially in the um, areas- what would you say on the suburban crawl or yeah, sprawl around, around the sprawl. periphery of the uh, of the city? So, so you've got so. Um, developers that are buying up land for you know millions of dollars or whatever, mm-hmm. and then they turn them into new suburbs. Effectively, right? They put all yes. the streets in, yeah. and then they all the infrastructure sub- divide up all the land. They can sell the land package. They can sell house and land packages, and you tend to have that kind of option, right? Mm. So, the government as well, I think, pushes people with those grants to try and buy. The yeah, houses because they that are want, being built. Yeah, they want the um, the money to be used in the building industry, so yes. that you're employing people rather than just employing real estate agents. Not that's wrong with anything wrong with real estate yeah. agents, but uh, they're the only people who you know get money transferred through them if you're buying an existing property. Whereas if you're buying a new one, then you're um, you're really just supporting the building industry as well. So that's the incentive, is it, from the government? It's we will give you I don't know whatever it is ten, fourteen, twenty thousand dollars is the now. grant. Yeah. But the idea there is that the money will sort of come back to the government by giving people jobs who are going to be um, building the house, doing the plaster, plastering the plumbing, the yeah, tiling, yeah, uh, everything related sense. to that. Yeah. So, what when you were growing up, was that scheme around? No. no and so, no. what was the kind of advice that you would get when you were- probably younger than my age, you would have been 25, I guess, or ish around there when you bought your first house. What was the kind of advice you were getting from your folks when it came to first house ownership and, and you know, searching and buying? And yeah, everything? well, it was funny because there's the whole idea of buying a block of land and building a house or and that house and land package thing just didn't exist. Yeah. Um, yes, you could have done it, but nobody thought that was what you did for your first house. Yeah. It was always just buy an established house and- the advice that my grandfather gave me and my parents gave me and a lot of other people always gave me, and, and it probably stands now if you're buying an existing house, is buy the worst house in the best location. And why that is you can that? Afford. Because the the value of the land is going to continue to go up if it's a really good location. Yep. Whereas you can improve the house that's on there, but you can't improve the value of the land because that's purely related to location. Yeah. And so, how do you think that that's changed through through time? Because it seems like obviously not- There are probably a substantial amount of people in the population who still live by that kind of rule mm. and are happy to sort of take a hit in living conditions and have a crappier house in a really good location or a better location. But there also seems to be these developments where the location is, you know, crappy in terms of it's no different from just suburb anywhere. Yeah. But people want um, the good qual well the good quality the the quality of living where you do have a new big um, yeah. large house yeah. and on top of that too to make the question even more complicated how have you seen houses change because they tend to today I think take up much more of the block than they used to yeah well I think the the two things are related uh, people now seem to have an expectation even first home buyers seem to have an expectation of having a a large family house. Um, you know, with a double garage, four or five bedrooms, two or three bathrooms, <laughs> two living areas. I'm raising my hand, guys. I'm raising my hand up. Well, that's what your expectation is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at the same time, um, developers are trying to maximise their profit by putting as many blocks as they possibly can into a development area. With the biggest and, houses and so on the they have smaller too, right? blocks and bigger houses. Yeah. And so, you know, when we grew up, everybody had the, you know, the Australian dream used to be a house on a quarter acre block in suburbia. And how, how and big is a quarter yeah, acre? A quarter roughly acre is uh, roughly 50 metres deep, 15 metres wide, yeah. rectangular. And most of the developments up until the 1980s uh, were just straight roads with rectangular blocks. Mm-hmm. And now most developments are uh, little cul-de-sacs and curvy roads and things because they're actually much more pleasant to live in because you don't have, even if you've got cars coming and going, you don't have these straight road thoroughfares where cars are going faster and they're louder and so on. So To pause you there quickly, cul-de-sac. 
cul-de-sac. That is a great word from French. Yes. And in French, it would be um, cul-de-sac, which yes. is the ass of a bag. Yes, at the end of the bag. <laughs> yeah. So, so, as if you've got a sack and you try and put your hand in and there's nowhere for the hand to go once you mm-hmm. get to a certain depth, that's the ass of so, the bag or the asshole of the bag. The dead end streets, really. <laughs> yeah, courts. Yeah, yeah, courts. Yeah. Yeah, so- it's it's interesting that there's that that shift then, right? That people my age now are kind of um, sacrificing location mm. for living standards, and I'm sort of at that point now, is trying to say for house loan, where I'm trying to work out what's the best option. Do I want to sacrifice house size and um, you know livability within that house for location, or do I want to sacrifice um, location? for yes. for that because yeah. that's that's the most difficult thing especially working from home yeah well working from home in the end the location is probably less important because you're going to need a bigger more comfortable space and you're going to be spending all your time in it so you you, know, you want that to be enjoyable you don't want it just to be a trial yeah so, yeah how have you noticed things changing um down the Bellarine peninsula where we live because i guess it's probably a um microcosm that's, you know, being replicated all over the country at the moment. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, um, you know, we came down here a couple of times on holidays, even just for day trips. But um, and Ocean Grove, where you used to live and I still live, um, was tiny. It probably had a thousand houses, most of which were holiday houses. And Mm. they were little shacks on uh, blocks of land because people all they wanted was somewhere to come and you know, dump their things so they can go to the beach because it was a it was a beach holiday place. And you'll still see um, that if you and go you still around see Ocean some Grove, of the old places. Yeah. There'll be holiday house. A lot of the houses that are there that are old are holiday houses, and you'll see that they take up barely any of the land, and they're quite often minute. You know, yeah. probably one or two bedrooms. Exactly. But a lot of them are getting bought up, smashed down, and then turned into these massive monstrosity townhouse double That's townhouses right. on yes. a separated block yeah. of land. Exactly. And sell it for a million and a half or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, and then when we moved in um, 25 years ago uh, to Ocean Grove, it had become much more residential, but still half the houses there were holiday houses. And the rest of Um, them were blocks of land with no houses. uh, Exactly. (laughs) And most of those little isolated individual blocks are now sold. There's really only a few of them left. And so, most of the development now around Ocean Grove has been in that periphery, you know, the the boundaries around the old Ocean Grove, yep. um, which were farmland when we moved in. And that farmland has been reclassified as residential and developers have bought it up and they've built those. So, there's two or three new housing estates, which are really like outer suburbs of mm. the town uh, that have grown up. And they're all building those, you know, four-bedroom, double-storey, big houses on them. So. Do you think that the farmers that own that land kind of get screwed over? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mind you, they make a lot of money, yeah, when but they, they don't necessarily the want to sell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, why do they have to sell? Because with rates, you everyone who owns some land anywhere in the country, there's certain rates on that land yes, based on where it basically is. Basically what- paying a tax to the local council. Yeah. Um, and it's the only way that the council can tax people because yeah. you pay you don't pay income tax or any other form of tax to local council. So mm-hmm. it's really just the landowners that are paying a land tax on that. Um, and then you pay a services component to that as well for the you know the water and the you know, garbage collection, um, which are really the only two things that you know the local council is providing. Uh, except in some cases they're managing roads, which aren't part of the state's responsibility. So. Um, yeah, you're paying for that, but then um, you pay according to the value of your property, um, and the value of your property is dependent on the zoning. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you're in a purely residential place, obviously a small block of land is worth quite a lot of, ma- of money. If you're in a rural designated area, then farmland, uh, yeah, farmland, then the individual rate per you know the area of the land isn't that much. Um, and uh, councils, of course, on the uh, the periphery or the on the I keep saying the word periphery. It must be the word for the day. Um, on the, <laughs> the outer edge. edges of the yeah. uh, of the town, are uh, um, councils are going to want to convert that into residential land, and so they rezone, mm-hmm. and then it's impossible for a uh, a farm. You know, Unless owner. they're millionaires. Yeah, and well, they can they'd have to be a lot pay. better than millionaires because they're yeah. all of a sudden, I don't know what the rate is on a, a um, on a rural property, a farm property, but if all of a sudden you're effectively going to be paying probably 10 or 20 times or more the amount of land yeah. tax on them when it gets rezoned, uh, 
But at the same time, that then gets sold off. So they'll make a lot of money by selling, but it effectively changes what obviously what they can do with the land in that interim period where the zoning change comes in. Yeah, it, it seems crazy. We had someone come in here to value the house yesterday and I was chatting mm-hmm. to her and she's like, everything around here has gone nuts after COVID with people moving oh, down. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And this house, when I was looking at online, it was sold in 2011, I think, off the plan for 160, 155 grand. Yeah. And the one across the road just sold for eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars, and that's a change in ten years. Yeah. You know, a growth of whatever that is, seven hundred percent or something stupid. I know. I know. And you just like, do you, do you? I guess there's there's two things I wanted to ask. Do you think that it's going to get harder and harder for people to buy houses? And um, do you think that the second question to that is, do you think that the the feel of towns like Ocean Grove is going to change dramatically? with this new influx of people from Melbourne and the prices going up. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's two things in that one. One is that the prices of land and houses um, in, say, Ocean Grove on the Bellarine Peninsula or any other sort of close country town uh, to big cities has always been much cheaper than living in the city. Um, you're effectively, you know, Ocean Grove's probably a population of between fifteen and 20,000 people now. Um, so it's about the size of one or two suburbs in the city of Melbourne. And for most people, unless you're living up on a clifftop overlooking the beach, you're really living in a place the equivalent of most of the suburbs of Melbourne. Um, but it used to be about half the price to buy a house. It's rapidly closing on the prices of houses in the suburbs of Melbourne now because of the demand and so many people are moving out of the city, particularly with COVID, when people have worked out that, you know, I can work from home, mm. I can live in a you know, a more pleasant place. I want If I want to go and live on the beach or if I want to go and live out in the bush somewhere, um, I can live where I want to live and still do the same job because I can work from home as long as I've got an internet connection. And so that's meant that people are coming down and they will pay – the Melbourne price or the Sydney price or the Brisbane price of of a house because or a little bit less. They go, oh, for eighty percent of the price of a house, I can move it, move away from the city, and well, so that puts the the local people under stress. To the some demand degree, right? the is then- higher, and people are willing to pay more for yeah. houses. And so the house local- across the road from us, we were paying four fifty a week in Ocean Grove, and the house across the road. Was listed at six fifty yeah. for a similar sized house that had been renovated, but had things like no aircon. There was no garage or anything, and it was no. six hundred and fifty dollars a week. And it disappeared after a week, and people have already moved in. Yeah. And you're like, if it, it you know, I would bet a million dollars those people are from Melbourne, and we're probably paying more than that in terms of rent yeah. in Melbourne, exactly, and have sacrificed it to come down here. Whereas if it had just been someone locally looking to rent that house, they would have been like dreaming. Yeah. There's yeah. no way. <laughs> So, do you fear that um, it's going to- there's going to become, you know, this kind of class differences in these towns? Ocean Grove feels like- I don't know if I want to use the word gent- gentrified, gentrified, but yeah. it feels a lot richer than it did when I was a kid. There tends to be a vibe now of just mm. really well-off people. You see a lot more expensive cars. Um, you see a lot less of, of the kinds of people that I grew up with at school and everything like that. They seem to have moved to different suburbs. They've been priced out. Yeah. So, do you think that that's going to happen more and more or it's just a shuffling effect where- uh, Look, I, I think it is. In some highly desirable places to live, then they are going to get disproportionately higher land prices and house prices. Um, I remember uh, when we moved, you know, in Ocean Grove, we've been there for 25 years, as I said, and- I remember the first house that it probably wasn't the first house, but the first time I had heard of a house selling for a million dollars in Ocean, Ocean Grove. Grove. Yeah. And that was outrageous. <laughs> you know, that was crazy. Our house is probably worth a million dollars now. Yeah. It wasn't a year ago, but it probably is now. And well, there's I think nothing it w- it special be, about our house. It if, be if, hard if it got to sold, find- people would just bulldoze it and build another house on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, or two. So, yeah. Or two. Exactly. It'd so. be hard to find a house now in Ocean Grove for under seven hundred, eight hundred thousand yeah, dollars, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just gone uh, bananas. Soon they will all be over a million dollars. Yeah. And no that's, matter where that's they are. That's just because of that desirability of a place to live. Yet there are still plenty of places out in, you know, country Victoria away from the coast and away from the mountains that you can buy, you know, in farm country, you can buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, and if you want to live close to a city or in a place that is geographically desirable from a point of view of, you know, access to the beach or parks or those sorts of things, then, you know, you've got to pay a lot of money. But there's still plenty of places to live around, you know, most of Australia. 
um, that are three hours drive away from the from a big city. Um, they're in a small country town, but there's nothing wrong with small country towns. Yeah. Um, it's in fact there's something you know highly desirable about small country towns. If you like the sense of community, you move into a community where everybody knows each other and they're looking out for each other. They wave at you and say, "Hey, good day, Pete." When you're walking down the street. That doesn't happen in Ocean Grove. No. You, know, you might know people. one in a hundred people. but mm. And even in country towns, I know I've just spent the last you know, couple of times or two days over the last couple of weeks traveling around uh, central and northwest Victoria doing family history research. And, you know, I walk down the street in these little places and people wave at you and say, good day. Well, that was uh, Lord Howe Island when we went on a trip there because it had a population of like- 350. 350 people, including yeah. the tourists or whatever. Exactly. And, and you were right. like, Jesus, it's so weird when you're in a place that has such a small population. Mm. The thing, I guess, that that is sort of the existential crisis that I'm faced with is, you know, do you try and live somewhere like that, which I would not have a problem with? But sacrifice um, proximity to your family and yeah. and to where you grew up because that's the trade off for me at least. There are obviously plenty of places in Australia that I ha- I'd have no problem living in, but for the fact that I don't want to be three hours, five hours, ten hours, twenty four hours drive yeah. away yeah. from my family and where I grew up and everything. Mm. So, what would you suggest finishing up this episode for people that are listening and who are either thinking of buying a house in Australia or are Australian citizens and, and have access to the kinds of yeah. um, help from the government, mm-hmm. what would your suggestion be for for people buying their first home? Uh, look, ultimately- I mean, it's a broad question. Yeah, and very broad. Everyone, um, <laughs> everyone has different circumstances. <laughs> yeah, but what's exactly. sort of some good advice for, for people thinking about that stuff? Well, I, I think, in, and we've intimated it in the conversation around the world has changed over the last 12 months uh, in so many ways. And one of those is- you don't necessarily need proximity to work. Yeah. And depending on the type of work you're doing, um, you know, there's still going to be plenty of places where you know, if you're in the service industry, you can't do that virtually. You have to actually be in a location. <laughs> I'll serve uh, you at yeah, the restaurant that's o- right, online. <laughs> online, exactly. <laughs> I'll take your order online. Just, you know, log into the app. And that's it. Um, and the robot's bringing it to your table that's now. That's right. So, <laughs> I think I think that will- if you're, in a, uh, if you're in a work position where you don't need- to be in a workplace, you can work from home, yeah. then that changes your perspective completely over where you want to live. And then you've mentioned the family issues and so on. But take all of that aside, what sort of location do you want to live in and what are you willing to compromise on? Yeah. You know, I would love to live somewhere down the Great Ocean Road with a clifftop view of the beach and things, but there is zero chance I will ever be able to afford to li- to buy mm. there. If I'd bought a house 40 years ago, I could have afforded it, but nobody wanted to live there. And I didn't want to live there because I was working three hours drive from there. Yeah. And I was a school teacher and you, know, you can't be, you know, well, you can be a virtual school teacher these days, but certainly couldn't be 30 or 40 years ago. So- I think that's it, is what are you willing to compromise and what are you not willing to compromise? And then it comes down to price. And yeah. um, the other piece of advice, and I think this is no matter where you are in the world, if you if residential property purchases is a standard, and a lot of places in Europe it's not. A lot of places in Europe people rent. just rent and that's the standard thing to do. People yeah. never think of buying a, a house or an apartment. Um, but just assume that this is going to be the biggest expense of your life but you're it's only you're only going to have to spend it once yeah because once you're in then you're going to be able to use the equity you've got to buy another house afterwards if you need to move um and just bite the bullet and do it because realistically unless something really dramatic happens you're never going to lose money on real estate. Well, they were saying even the the woman that was um, checking this house out and valuing it, she was just like, I said to her, what advice do you have for me as a first home own, uh, owner, you know, wanting to get out there and buy a house? And she's just like, buy anywhere here, yeah. buy anywhere. If it's if it's in, um, you know, St. Leonard's, which is sort of a, a town that's kind of getting developed and it's further away from the mm. um, the surf coast at the moment and, and everything. Further she's away like, from Geelong. Yeah. She's like, you buy a house off the plan that gets built by Metricon or one of these other developers and she's like, what? when it's built, it'll be worth thirty dollars to $40,000 more than what you paid for it. So, you could literally sell it there and make a profit, mm. although you'll have to pay stamp duty and everything. Yeah. But she was just like, just get in the door. Even if it's uh, one of the cheaper ones, just get something, get started and then move on to, you know- wherever you want to end up. So, is that one thing too? You need to kind of try and take into account 
getting in as soon as possible, maybe not in the place you ultimately want to get, mm -hmm. but just get something that you're paying off that you can then um, leverage later on to end yeah, up in a place yeah, that you want to yeah. be. Or, or you, you can leverage the finances you've got to renovate. I mean, we bought a very cheap house yeah. in a, a beautiful place, but not a residentially desirable place when our first house, we bought our first house up in the, the yeah. hills, the mountains outside of Melbourne, and not many people want to live there. So, it's not a that the property value is going to continue continue to go up, but I was working there. So, that's where we wanted to buy. And in the end, we didn't move from that place yeah. uh, when we needed a bigger house. Just made we the borrowed house more money and we doubled the size of the house with a renovation. Um, and, you know, that's the other thing to look at is buy somewhere where you can easily renovate if you think you're going to want to expand rather yeah. than having to sell it and buy somewhere else. And there are plenty of places where that's going to be difficult or very expensive to if do. If you bought through a developer. And there are <laughs> other places where it's going to be easier. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the knowledge bombs, Dad. And I yeah. hope you guys enjoyed Opinion this bombs anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye. Alrighty, you mob. Thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Goss. If you would like to watch the video, if you're currently listening to it and not watching it, you can do so on the Aussie English TV channel on YouTube. This is different from the main channel. You'll be able to subscribe to that. Just search Aussie English TV. TV on YouTube. And if you're watching this and not listening to it, you can check this episode out also on the Aussie English podcast, which you can find via my free Aussie English podcast application on both Android and iPhone. You can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone, Spotify, podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is. I'm your host, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a ripper of a day and I will see you next time. Peace.